Sunday nights, we are studying on the book of Revelation. We're trying to wind it up, and that's been a difficult time doing so. And I've been putting the word Revelation on the board every week for some time on Sunday nights. We've spent, I don't know how many weeks we've been on it. I think we started uh, about 55, 60 weeks ago uh, on Sunday night teaching the book of Revelation. We have we have covered this book, uh, I mean, thoroughly. There's a few verses I may have not addressed, but we have really covered it to a great degree. I might just, uh, one week before I finish it up, just go into those verses that I haven't covered and bring those out just as a finishing touch on the book. But we're over here in... The 21st chapter, well, actually, we hadn't finished up the 20th chapter. Let's go there. Let's go to the 20th chapter. And this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. When the Scripture says that in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, the Scripture says, "...the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants..." Things which must shortly come to pass, not things which will come to pass a long time in the future. John is writing the book of Revelation uh, around 96 A.D. 96 A.D. So shortly would be 97 A.D., 98 A.D., and so forth all the way down to our present day. And they reveal to you by these words that you're not even catching or paying attention to, the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John. Now, God is signifying the things which will shortly come to pass. And, of course, the word signify is the word semiao, S-E-M. E-I-O-O, it comes from Simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. That word Simeon means a sign or a flag or a signal. Uh, When you give somebody a sign, a sign points to the thing, the thing. It points a sign points to the product. If you have a sign out front, if you're driving up down the road and somebody says, in this block, there's a paint store. You don't look for something that says cleaners. You don't look for something uh, that says tires. What you look for is something that says paint. What that is, is that's a sign that signifies where you can buy paint. Well, these signs come in the form of of illustrations of what the truth is. Uh, This is uh, pictures. This is figures. What this is, it is uh, is idioms and metaphors to point out the truth. Now, the word revelation is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O-K-A-L. U-P-S-I-S. Comes from apo, and that is the word revelation, apo and calupto. This is the revelation. This book is the revelation. Now, I've been as guilty as everybody else calling it revelations. It's not revelations. It is the revelation. The one revelation. And it's a picture. Revelation means to remove the cover. Apo meaning removal or off with, off with, or to set aside, set aside the cover, calupto. It means to set aside the cover. So when God takes the cover off, the way he's doing it, he's using these signals, these flags to point to the truth. And the flags come in the form of many things throughout the book. It's a Jewish book. It comes in the form of angels. 
There's four of them. Or there's seven of them. There's one set of angels. There's seven angels. And the word angel is A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And the Bible speaks. And what this is, it's, it's uh, idiomatic language. Seven, anytime you find seven from one end of the Bible to the other, it has the idea of completion. And the word angel is just the common Greek word messenger. You know what I think they sh should have done? I believe that when they translated the Bible, every time you have angel, it is our word messenger. Like down in, in uh, when you get into verse 16 of the first chapter, and he had in his right hand seven stars, Christ. He's talking about Christ standing in the midst of the candlesticks. And when you get down here explaining the stars, in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven candlesticks where Christ was standing, this is the way it ought to read in the English. The seven stars are the messengers. It says angels. It's the seven messengers of the seven churches. We've got to get out of this thing of, you know, they had this stupid TV show, Touched by an Angelos. And they've got some stupid, goofy person on there performing miracles. And nobody's ever talking about Jesus and death to self and salvation. They're talking about, well, some guy owns a bar down here and he's having a problem holding on to his bar. So this angel's got to go down and perform some miracle to, make, to keep the other guys from repossessing his bar. You know, that's the kind of thing they do. And that's dumb. Huh? That's Catholic. That's right. It's Catholic. <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> Gerald was raised Catholic. He always called it Catholic. I say cat lick. <laughs> it tickles me. Gerald makes Mary laugh. <laughs> when he says Catholic, that's Catholic. <laughs> Where was I? Gerald, you got me off now. I got to talking about you. <laughs> oh, the seven angels. The seven messengers. The guy is saving his bar room. Huh? The guy is saving his bar room. <laughs> okay, saving his bar room, yeah. That's <laughs> really crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Then, and then you've got uh, in the book, you've got uh, signs and pictures pointing to the truth. We've got all these Jewish terminology... Uh, you've got trumpets, and trumpets are voices, according to the fourth chapter and the first chapter of Revelation. Uh, the seven angels have the seven trumpets, so seven being the number of completion, this is the refined, seven is the number of refinement. Well, I've, uh, the word, the number seven in the Old Testament means to refine, or it means to be completed. Uh, that's what this word means. So, this word seven has to do, the seven angels would be the refined messengers, is what it would mean. That is a sign pointing to the real thing. The refined messengers is us when we go through the, the fiery trials of life. And then you got trumpets that are voices that the angels are sounding the trumpets there in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. You've got, these are, you got the seven candlesticks. And that's Jewish, isn't it? That's Jewish. And the seven candlesticks, that's the candlesticks that was in the temple in the Old Testament. And the Bible says the candlesticks are the seven churches. Now, people that don't like the church being Israel, you got seven candlesticks, which is Jewish, which is the refined church. How people can come up and not believe the church is Jewish is beyond me. And then you've got, you've got the uh, 24 elders... And they serve around the, around the throne of God. 
And the throne, the throne was the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament where God came down out of the sky of glory and sat on the Ark of the Covenant. And he ruled Israel from there. Well, the 24 elders are around the throne and around the throne, around this throne, the high priests, the high priest were around that throne and you had 24 sets of high priests. These are the sons of Ithamar, Ithamar and Eliezer. And the 24, the 24 courses are found there in the 24th chapter of 1 Chronicles. And you have the four beasts with the faces of a, of a lion, uh, the ox, uh, the eagle, and man. And these are the four in the ninth chapter of Genesis that God formed a covenant with. When Noah come out of the ark, he said, I'll form a covenant with the beast of the field. And the king of the beast is the lion with the cattle of the field. The ox represented the cattle, the, the fowl of the air, the eagle represented the fowl. And then man, then man. So when you see these four-faced beasts, it's merely signs and signals and flags pointing to God's protective covenant to his people. That's what the signals are. And then, of course, you've got the sea. You have the, uh, you have the a, a sea of crystal, a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And, of course, the looking glasses of the women were used to make the brazen sea. And that was right here in front of the... In front of the uh, temple and there's the altar and here's the altar of incense and there's the candlesticks here's the table of showbread all of this is you find in revelation and you've got that altar of incense altar of incense and the bible says that that is the prayers of the saints so this is back to what we were talking about this morning the very image has been nailed to the uh, the uh, the literal or the shadows have been nailed to the cross. And now these things are very images in and to see this. <coughs> to see this picture. You know what this is doing? This is like parables. That's signs are like parables. Signs and signals and flags. Jesus said, I speak in parables so that the believers can understand. Look at that in Matthew 13. That's what these pictures are. They're like parables. Look at Matthew, the 13th chapter. Matthew 13. When he gives us these pictures, these are, I, you might call these picture parables. Look here in Matthew, the 13th chapter. Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Talking about the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. Why do you speak in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, my apostles, and you are the nucleus of the church, it is given unto you to know the mysteries. It's given unto you, and I'm going to reveal the mysteries to you and to the church about things which will shortly come to pass all the way to the end of time. That will be the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's given to us to understand this abstract language. Is anybody having a hard time understanding that? Huh? You try to talk this to some Baptist or Church of Christ, they're going, what are you talking about? Well, baptism is baptism. It's just dipping somebody in water. What are you talking about? But baptism. And they'll cut you off because they're, you know what keeps them from seeing this? They're proud of their Baptist church, their Church of Christ. They're proud of their doctrine, their false doctrine. They're so proud of it. When you start talking to them, 
They build a Bugs Bunny wall. That's what they do. Have you ever seen him build a wall in, in a cartoon? Brrr, like that. It, you start, as soon as you start talking about predestination, they go, brrr, and they look at you with a glazed look in their eye. I, when he gets through talking, I'll say what I want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, listen to me. Isn't that it? That's what they're doing. They're proud of their false doctrine. And they can't understand the parables and they can't understand the flags and the signals. They can't understand what Jesus was saying when it says he sent his angels to signify this. And they say, he answered because it's given to you to know the mysteries. The word mystery is musturian. It means to shut the mouth. Musturian, it comes from muo, meaning to shut the mouth. God has pulled the cover off of the mysteries. The mystery is the unrevealed. And revelation is the revealed, pulling the cover off and revealing. The way he's revealing his word to us is showing us these shadows and these very images. And we see, these, we see the flags and the signals. We see all of these things pointing to the real thing. Well, you've got the altar of incense. That's the prayers of the saints, according to the fourth and fifth, uh, the fifth chapter of Revelation. The altar of incense, the smoke goes up before the Lord, and this is the prayers of the saints, the Bible says. And you've got these four beasts, and then you've got, you've got the, the throne of God, and the throne was the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God came and sat down on it. I guess that would be a throne, wouldn't it? There was a mercy seat there. It was a mercy seat because God sat down on that seat. The Bible says he dwelt among the cherubim, and there's four cherubim around the throne of God. These four beasts with the lion, the ox, and the eagle, and the man faces. Well, there's four, there's four beasts. You got two of them uh, embroidered into, the, into that eight-inch thick veil, and you got one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. So you got these four beasts around the throne of God. And we went, we've gone through Revelation... We've seen how this is a Jewish book. And what men can't see, Jesus... Let's read the rest of this in Matthew. The reason they could not see, the Pharisees were proud of their Phariseeism. Baptists are proud of Baptist doctrine. Church of Christ are proud of Church of Christ doctrine. I had uh, Jared tell me today, he went to eat with me and Mary. Me and him and Jerry went and Mary... And he said, my brother don't like you. I said, why? He said, your hermeneutics is all wrong. Well, Hermes, we get the word hermeneutics from Hermes. He was the interpreter of the gods. Now, why? They would name, why in these seminaries, they would name something after the interpreter of the gods. And hermeneutics means to interpret the scripture. Why would they name it after a sun god? It's beyond me. Hermes, Hermes was also the same as Mercury. The winged God, and he was the interpreter of the gods. Now, why they would say that is beyond me, you know. What was I going to tell you? He didn't, like he didn't like my hermeneutics, yeah. And I said, what he doesn't like, uh, Jared, I said, is because he, when he says my hermeneutics is wrong, what he meant was I won't follow after any ecclesiastical authority like the Baptist Sunday School Board or the Assemblies of God National Council or whatever these guys call themselves in the Church of Christ. I was not associated with them. Now, whatever it is. Yeah, well, I know that, but it's the same, same thing. Because I won't follow some ecclesiastical authority and because... What he's talking about, I won't follow the standard beliefs. When I go into McClinic and Strong and I go into my Greek text and I go into the culture and the customs of the ancient world, because I won't follow anybody that's going on today, because I say there is no water baptism anymore, there is no crackers and grape juice, and boy, they don't want you to call it crackers and grape juice, but that's Holy Communion. <laughs> now I say they were eating the Passover. Because I won't follow some standard doctrine, that's what he's angry at me. And he said, who is Jim Brown? Who, he, who does he think he is that he won't uh, 
be under authority to somebody else. You give me some preacher that's older than me that studied more and that has got some church foundation who believes exactly what we believe and I will more be more than happy to run to him and say, let's talk. And I'd love to have, I'd love to have a man 80 years old I could go to and say, preacher, I, I'm so discouraged. Can you... Uh, Give me some encouragement. I had a man like that when I was about 26, 27, and he was 65, and I would go to him, and his name was Roy Kemp, and I'd sit down in his den. I'd sit down in the floor in front of him. i said, say, Dr. Roy, uh, I need to talk to you. I'd pour out my heart to him, and he'd say, boy, uh, that's the way the world is. They're crazy, ain't they? I'd say, yeah, they are. And he'd, he'd hug me and, and, and uh, pat me on the shoulder and be a father in the ministry to me. I wish I had that. I wish there's somebody I could fellowship with. But if, they, if these guys think I'm going to go under some ecclesiastical powers like the Baptist or the Assembly of God or the Pentecostals or Charismatic, you tell me some preacher is telling the truth and I'll be more than happy to go sit down at his feet. But they're not telling the truth. People say, Jim Brown don't like anybody. I, I, love, I love Martin Luther. And I love John Calvin. And I dearly love Thomas Watson. I mean, that man convicts my heart. But those guys are dead a long time ago. And nobody's preaching what they're preaching, what they were preaching in their books. In the Doctrine of Repentance of Thomas Watson, or you read Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther, and there ain't nobody talking about that today. Well, I am. I don't have the vocabulary and the education he had. He was such an unbelievably brilliant man. And I have a high regard for him, but not for these squirrels in pulpits today. I'm not going to follow them. That's what we used to call them years ago. Now, let's read the rest of this. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries. Should I say it's given unto you to know the signs and to know the flags and the signals? It's given unto us. We're willing to set aside our father, our mother, our sisters, our brothers. We're willing to set aside all these things. Our denomination, our dear old grandfather and grandmother. My grandfather was the sweetest, kindest, gentlest man. And he was as ignorant as the day is long. Because I used to try to talk to him about the Bible when I was 20. And I went, Jimmy, and he, you know what? He always reminded me of Dwight D. Eisenhower, except he had hair. Because you know how Dwight Eisenhower always just smiled at everybody in soft voice. And that's the way my grandfather was. And my mother said, well, if it's good enough for daddy, it's good enough for me. And my grandfather would go into this church where he used to go. And he'd go to sleep on the, on the pew. And then he'd get up in the middle of the service and walk across the street to a Dairy Queen type thing during the middle of Sunday morning service and get him a hamburger. That's what my grandfather did. Having a sweet little grandfather doesn't mean a thing. Does it? Not a thing. My grandpa was just ignorant. It's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it is not given. They can't see the flags or the signals. Can they? For whosoever hath, to him it shall be given. Hath what? Have the ear and the eye to see flags and signals. And it will be given to him. And he shall have more abundance of truth. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Ray Charles had a song, them that got or them that gets. And I ain't got nothing yet. And it was patterned after this verse right here. Therefore speak I to them in parables... Because they seeing see not the flags or the signals. That's what he's talking about. They can't see abstract things in Scripture. They can't see the very image as opposed to the literal in the Old Testament. They can't see the pictures. They can't understand idiomatic language and metaphors. 
In hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. And this is quoted from Isaiah, the sixth chapter. This is predestination. When we see the flags and signals, that's because we're the elect of God. Which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. The word stupid means dull of hearing. It's the word ba'ar in the Hebrew. It's the word alogos in the Greek. In their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. Lest they should be converted and I should heal them. I don't want them. They're not elect. They're proud of their doctrines. They can't see and hear signals and flags and beacons. This word also means a beacon. This word Simeon means a beacon. That's like a man being out on the sea. And he sees this beacon, this lighthouse going like this. He says, hey, look at there. There's land. Let's take off for that. No. Anytime you see a lighthouse... There's rocks there. That's a rocky place. You're not supposed to take your ship in there at all. They don't understand the beacon. The beacon of that lighthouse is pointing to the rocks below. Ships don't come here. That's what it means. But they don't understand the beacon. They look at a train signal... They look at this and say, oh gosh, look at those pretty lights. Let's drive up there on that track and watch them things blink. (laughs) Ain't that pretty? (laughs) No, you don't drive up on the track. That's what the Bible's talking about. They don't understand that. They drive down the road, they're looking for paint, and it says paint, and they go, well... Maybe that's not it. Maybe we need to go down here to the fruit stand. That's how stupid and ignorant the world is when it comes to looking at flags and signals. He said, lest they should be converted and I should heal them, that's predestination. When the Bible says that God, by his angel, is going to bring to John by, and he's going to signify these things, he's saying, The only people that will see this, see these flags and signals, will be the predestinated elect of God. That first verse of Revelation is predestination. Can we see that? People will not see the flags and signals and recognize beacons. That's like, hey, ahoy, mate. Is that the Jolly Roger? What is that out there? Oh, that's a nice picture of a skull and crossbones. Uh, on a ship, gosh, that's pretty. Let's go over there and ask him if we can get one of those flags. Yeah, that's a bunch of pirates. They can't recognize a flag. You go over there close to them, you better run for your life. When they hoist up the Jolly Roger, because you don't, they're going to come in and pillage and rape your ship and take all the goods away. They don't recognize flags. They can't tell that that's a pirate ship. They don't know the difference between that and the stars and stripes. Which that's how shallow the world is. It Because they have not ever defined. When you see, when you see that, this is the Jolly Roger right here. Like so. Well, I'll get it here in a minute. Let me do it over here. Ain't enough room there. When you see this, here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. And you see this on a ship. When you see that, 
That's called the Jolly Roger. That is what they put on pirate ships. These people don't know the difference between a pirate ship and the, and the Queen Mary that's flying the Stars and Stripes. They have never bothered to define these things. They can't see flags. They can't see signals. God said, I have blinded their eyes. They're proud of what they think they know. And they don't define the difference between this, the stars and stripes, the, what is it? The Jack, something, uh, the English, huh? Union Jack. Union Jack of England. They don't, haven't defined the difference between any of them. And they don't know one from the other. That's what preachers are doing in the pulpit. They cannot see flags and signals. This is quoted from, this is, and then he says, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. He's saying, blessed are your eyes for they can see flags and signals and beacons and distinguish between one and the other. That's why I speak to you in parables. For verily I say unto you for that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things that you apostles are seeing. And have not seen them because they didn't live until my time. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Then he says, hear the parable of the sower. And then he gives them flags and signals all through this, doesn't he? He gives you the four seeds that are sown. That's a flag. And what's so amazing, he shows these four seeds being sown. And then you go over here to later in the chapter and people say, what does all this mean? What is the, I don't want to go through all. Well, let's read. Let's read down through the four seeds. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Hear the parable. Look here. Parabole, P-A-R-A, B-O-L-E. That is the word parable. It comes from para and B-A-L-L-O. You remember, the, remember those words? You remember the word D-I-A-B-O-L-O-S? Diabolos is one of the words for devil. It comes from dia and B-A-L-L-O. Diabalo means the method of casting out or down. This word balo means to throw. It is our word. It is our word, B-A-L-L. -L. It means to throw out or down. And para means alongside. It means to throw something down alongside something. Here's the real, here's the parable, or here is the flag. A flag is a parable, a beacon. Uh, a flag or a beacon or a sign. That is a parable. He's saying we can see the flags and the signs they can't see. What keeps a man from seeing a flag? What keeps him from seeing a sign? He has never educated himself in signs. He's never learned. He's never learned to spell and he cannot read P-A-I-N-T. He's never bothered to find out what paint is. Uh, I would tell a story on myself. My father was real braggart and boasting and loud. And he told me, Jimmy, you can just go out and talk your way into a job. And you can do it. And I believed my father. And at 20 years old, I, he said, I'll take you down here to the union in Denver. And we'll, we'll get you uh, in the carpenter's union. And you go out and become a carpenter. I'd never gone through any kind of apprenticeship. And he went down there and got me a... a got me on the, into the uh, union, carpenter's union. I went out on a job. I put on a, a steel hat and put on overalls. I had hammers and everything around me. <laughs> and I went out there and I would, and I'd try, and I'd, and a guy would say, he said, y'all can go over here and put these, put these frames together. And I'd got over this old carpenter. He said, hand me that joist. And I said, what's a joist? <laughs> 
and I'd try to nail, and I'd bend the, I'd bend the nail, and, and the supervisor. See, I had never defined those things. I just listened to my father say, hey, we don't have to know flags and signals and beacons. We, you don't have to know what it means. Just go out, tell them you can do it, and then do it. And the supervisor came to me about six hours into the day, and he said, you're not a carpenter. I said, did it take you all day long to figure that out? I thought my father used to get me in lots of trouble. <laughs> but you know why I couldn't carpenter? I had never practiced it, and I'd never defined a joist. I had never f- defined uh, the terminology. I couldn't recognize flags and signals. Could I? That's what's wrong. This is, look here. He there for the parable, the flags and signals of the sower. Here's the flags and signals. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. But it never did take root. It's sown into some man. He comes in here and sits here. He doesn't have ears to hear. He's comparing this without, with people that don't have ears to hear and eyes to see. He's saying... Apostles hear the parable, but unbelievers can't hear it. And he said, this, and he said, catches the way that was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, stony ground. I was telling Stan the other night that they had... The wayside. If, they, if you had several fields here. You had several fields. Planted. They had the wayside. Or what they called the narrow way. Were these little stony paths. That went between these fields. And you could, you could walk. They kept a stony path. So they could walk out through these fields. The broad way was the street. In front of the fields. And they they were wide. I can't remember. Does anybody remember when I was reading that the other night? How broad the broadways were. It's like 16 cubits. And these were like four cubits. And where the, where the stone fell in the, uh, in the wayside or in the stony ground, this was the wayside or that was the narrow way. That's what they called the narrow way. Most people travel the broad way and a few people would walk back through the fields to go over to this street over here. But everybody didn't do that. Only a few would walk through these fields. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying, some seed fell in stony places the same as he. He's saying, here's the flag or the signal. The same as he that heareth the word. And anon with joy receiveth it. Somebody comes in here to Grace and Truth Ministries. Boy, they like this. Boy, I like this. This is good information. And yet, hath he not root in himself, but he endures for a while. He dureth for a while. He stays for a while. For when tribulation, when philipsis, the narrow way, Or persecution ariseth because of the word. They go to their family. They tell their family the truth. And the family says, you're in a cult. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. That Jim Brown, I don't like him. That Jim Brown. I've had a bunch of people say when they first come here, they thought my first name was that. When, When persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitful of riches, deceitfulness of riches, choke the word. I like that word choke because I know all about that. Sum penigo. S-U-M. P-N-I-G-O. That means to wheeze. To wheeze down completely. To get into, uh, uh, I can't breathe. 
The word is choked, but if you'll notice here, the deceitfulness of riches chokes the word. It doesn't say the seed didn't take root. What is it that chokes the word? What is it that chokes the vine? The tares and the briars move up into the vine. This is a picture. This is talking about seed being sown and the word being choked. And what chokes the wheat when it's planted is tares and briars. So it's up to the husbandman to come and cut out the tares and the briars. So I don't believe that this is necessarily talking about an unbeliever here. This is a believer, I believe, that hasn't been trimmed yet. And becometh, it says, becometh unfruitful. Well, if you've got a vine here that becomes unfruitful, you still have the vine. It has root. Up there in verse 21, that second seed has no root. And Jesus is the root out of dry ground, isn't he? They can't see these flags and signals and pictures. And becometh unfruitful. But he that received the seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold and some sixty and some thirty. And another, and he goes into another parable, but look down here. Look down here in verse 36. And people say, what does all this mean? Then Jesus said to the multitude in verse 36, and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil that sowed the tares. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. And I like what Luke, the 8th chapter, Luke, the 8th chapter is a parallel chapter to this in Luke 8. I love verse 11. Verse 11, when the charismatics say, plant your seed, uh, and they say, send us your seed. Well, the word seed is the word sperma. It is our word sperm. In its masculine gender, masculine and gender, I've never seen a male dollar bill or a male quarter or a male check. The seed is the word of God. You know, next time one of those guys say, send us your seed faith. What you need to do is go down to the feed store and get a bag of uh, bird seed and send it to Paul Crouch. Say, I want this to multiply into $100,000. Here's my seed I want to plant in your ministry. The seed is the Word of God in verse 11. The seed is the Word. The Word is made flesh and dwelt among us. Here's the seed we plant. The Scriptures, not money. That's dumb. Isn't it? Stupid, stupid, stupid. And this, and all of this is a reference back to Matthew 13. It's all a reference back to speaking in parables because God doesn't want those people to see and hear flags and beacons. And that's quoted from Isaiah 6. Look at Isaiah 6. Isaiah, the sixth chapter. I don't know what got me on this tonight, but I want you to understand what flags and beacons are. They're the same thing as parables. 
parable means to throw down alongside. That's what flags are. There's something thrown down alongside the truth to point to the truth. Look here in Isaiah 6. Isaiah the 6th chapter, this 13th chapter is a reference back to Isaiah 6. I refer to this a lot. And... Well, let me, read, let me read down through this, and then I'm going to get back to the subject tonight. I want you to see what he's saying in the first chapter of Revelation. I'm sending these things to signify. An angel's going to come and give you flags and signals. Who is he going to give flags and signals and beacons to? Just the elect. When the Bible says that in Matthew... The 16th chapter in those first four verses, that a wicked of the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Give us a sign, give us a Simeon. Jesus said they can't recognize Simeon. They said, Give us a flag, give us a beacon, give us a signal. That's what they said. And he said, the only flag, the only signal, the only beacon you're going to get is the signal, the flag, the beacon of the prophet Jonah. What is Jonah's flag or beacon? Resurrection. Anastasis. The only sign to these people will be the resurrection, the anastasis, that's feminine gender. And that's the resurrection of Christ in us. The only thing that God's going to let people see, and the only people they're going to see are the men that have eyes and ears. The, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Men cannot recognize beacons and, and flags and signals. The Pharisees, Jesus said... A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're adulterous. You've gone after other gods. You've gone after your own doctrine. You've gone after your halakha and your gana. And you've changed the word of God. And you can't see. They can't recognize flags and signals. They can't recognize parables, can they? They can't recognize it. And he said, the only sign you're going to get is the resurrection. And that's the gospel, isn't it? That's the only sign to the Pharisees. So therefore, if that is the sign, if the resurrection is the sign, all of the flags and signals of revelation are about us resurrecting in Christ, isn't it? When you get into the temple and the throne of God... In Revelation 4, the throne of God is where God sits. Now we're the temple of God and he sits upon our hearts. He's written in fleshy tables of the heart. That is resurrection, isn't it? That's death to self and resurrection. You can take all the flags and the signals and the beacons all through Revelation. It is Christ being revealed Apocalypto, the cover taking off, and the mystery, he told the apostles, it's given to you to understand the mysteries. But the Pharisees can't understand it. And why is it the Pharisees wanted a sign? They're used to getting signs, that's it. The Jews seek a sign there in the first Corinthians, the first chapter. The Greeks look after seek after wisdom. The Jews always got signals and beacons. They got a fire by night, a cloud by day. Their shoes didn't wear out. They got, they got water out of a rock. They got manna from heaven. They got all these signs. They could whip their enemies. Their clothes didn't wear out. I wonder if they got B.O. <laughs> Their feet did not swell up in a desert where it was 130 degrees. The Bible says their feet didn't swell up. That's the signs they got. And they said, give us a flag or a beacon. Jesus said, it's not given to you to understand flags and beacons. You can't even understand the resurrection in God's people when they're dying daily. 
Do you know that those of us that are dying daily, you take some guy that's a pagan out here, just an out and out pagan, he thinks that we are just like those people at the big Baptist church or the big church of Christ. He thinks we're just like, that all of us are just alike. He cannot see Christ resurrecting us in death to self. He thinks predestination is the same thing as free will. He can't tell the difference. And even at the big churches, they think we serve the same Jesus they do. The same God they do. Even though the Bible says you serve the God that you yield to. There in Romans 6, 16. No, you're not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey. Your servants are to whom you obey. It doesn't matter what you name him and call him. You can call him Jehovah, but if you're not bound to Jehovah, it's not Jehovah you serve. It's self you serve. That's hard, isn't it? Look here in Isaiah 6. Let's just read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, one of the most famous kings of Israel, we're going to get to Uzziah in our studies when we get back to the Old Testament. Uzziah reigned for 40 or 50 years in, for 50 years in Israel. And then he decided he wanted to go into the into the holy place and put on the robes of the priest and God struck him with leprosy. Uzziah gave Israel their aqueducts, all of their modern systems that modern up to that, that day and time. He was truly a developer in Israel. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting up on a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Why did he say holy three times? Father, Son, and the Spirit. He's three times holy God. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that, moved, uh, that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. This is from the altar of incense. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. This is Isaiah speaking. Unclean lips, not because he had dirty lips. Because his heart wasn't fixed to preach the truth. And remember, Jeremiah, the Lord told Jeremiah in the first chapter, I'll put my words in your mouth and they'll be like fire. There in Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. Unclean lips mean we have no fire in our mouth. We have no judgment of God in our mouth. Tongues of fire is is talking about the word of God coming from the lips of God's apostles. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips who won't say the truth. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand. This is a flag, a beacon, a signal. This is a parable. It doesn't mean literal seraphim came and put literal hot coals on Isaiah's lips. Which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. This is what's amazing. Let me give you this. In the, in the temple of God, now he's going, he takes the tongs, there were gold tongs, here's the, here's the, the tabernacle, or the temple, it became the temple Here's the veil, Ark of the Covenant, seven candlesticks, altar of incense. And what this is a picture of, here's the brazen sea and here's the altar. When they wanted to light the incense on the altar of incense, 
they would bring fire from this altar right here where they were burning these sacrifices up to God and they had to bring fire with golden tongs and place it upon this altar of incense and then, and then pour the incense upon it and it went up towards God. Isaiah is speaking of himself as though his mouth is this altar of incense. And in Revelation, the fifth chapter, the Bible says that the Bible speaks of the altar of incense as the prayers of the saints. And it speaks here as the altar of incense as being the mouth of Isaiah. Or the prayers of Isaiah before God. And Isaiah is going to bow to the will of God. And that's what prayer is. Let's read this. Tongs from off the altar. And if you, if you put, if you lit the altar of incense with any fire other than fire from the altar, it was called strange fire. And when Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, Nabad, Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, they got fire to put on the altar of incense from somewhere other than that altar. And that's what this is referring to right here. And he laid it upon my mouth. He didn't lay it upon the altar of incense. He laid it on the mouth of Isaiah. This is, a, this is an Old Testament parable. It is a picture of what God does to us when he's ready for us to speak the truth. To, to cleanse our lips is to cleanse our heart, isn't it? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away. Not because he put a coal upon his lips. It's because spiritually God cleansed Isaiah's heart so he could speak the truth, isn't it? And thy sin is purged. This is a parable. This is a flag or a beacon. Can you see that? It's a signal. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Isaiah knew that his heart had been cleansed. He knew his mouth had been cleansed. And you will know when God's dealt with your heart, this was the call of God upon Isaiah to preach the truth because God cleansed his heart and now he's no longer a man of unclean lips. I heard one preacher say, Isaiah said, well, I'm unclean, but here am I. You can send me. No, he didn't. No, he did not say that. Then said I, here am I. You've cleansed my mouth and cleansed my lips. Send me. And God said, go and tell this people, Israel, hear ye indeed, but understand not. Isaiah can see, and he's going to preach the parables and the flags and the signals, the beacons. But the people are not going to hear, are they? They're going to be scattered. Northern Israel is going to be scattered by the Assyrians because they will not see and hear. And that's what God says. But who caused them not to see and hear the parables of God? God did. He says this right here. But understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people, Israel, fat. And make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes. This is the quotation right before the parable of the seed and the sower in the 13th chapter of Matthew and the 8th chapter of Luke. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert 
and be healed. And Matthew says, lest they be, should, should be converted and I should heal them. God said, I don't want them. I'm going to extend the gospel to the Gentile elect. And that's Isaiah's entire message from one end of this book to the other. Then said I, Lord, how long am I supposed to preach to people and they won't listen? How would you like to have that calling? Stan, uh, Jerry, uh, Dwayne, Brian, Jeff, Ken. Gerald, go preach. Nobody's going to listen to you. Now go do it. <laughs> oh, man. Isaiah's going, oh, oh, man. How long should I do this, Lord? And he answered, until the cities are wasted without inhabitant until I literally rip Israel up and carry them in captivity. You do this and they are not going to hear you, Isaiah. Do what I tell you. Boy, we think we have a hard calling in America. He said, I'm not converting Israel. He tells Jeremiah, pray not for this people. Preach judgment to them. But don't you dare pray for them, Jeremiah. <laughs> Same thing he's saying here. If we had the calling of Jeremiah and Isaiah, we, wouldn't we just say, we want to give up in America? We got each other, don't we? They didn't have each other. Until the houses are without man and the land be utterly desolate, until I call the Assyrians to scatter northern Israel, until I call Nebuchadnezzar to come and devastate southern Judah, until there's no inhabitants in the land, you go do it. I'm going to give them eyes they can't see. I'm going to make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, that they, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. What does Proverbs 20 and 12 say? The hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord hath made even both of them. And he, this is predestination, and he is not going to open the eyes and ears of Israel, is he? No. And the Lord have removed men far away until I call Assyria and Babylon to devastate Israel. You go preach the truth and you'll have no converts. Well, how can that glorify God? God's going to be glorified in their destruction. Isn't he? And there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land... And yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten. Only 50,000 people came back from Judah's captivity. Just a small amount came back. As a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. And they're going to be scattered and cast their seed away from Israel. This is an Old Testament parable, isn't it? This is a flag, a signal, a beacon. And when you find the word token. Well, I'm not going to get into that right now because that would be a lot of speculation. Uh, it would be in a sense that God is going to tithe to himself a tenth. In a very small, there were millions that were carried away into Babylon. And when you read the book of Ezra, I believe it's the second chapter, he'll tell you how many came back. A very small amount. Just, just slightly under 50,000 of the millions that were there. They did not return. They did not repent. And God said, it's because I've given them heavy ears and eyes they can't see or hear. And I've given them the spirit of slumber. That's, well, go back over here to Romans. I'm... Look here, you find this in Romans 11, Romans 11, this sounds like a Wednesday night message, doesn't it? Predestination. Romans 11, well, I'm talking about, I'm talking about flags and signals and beacons. I'm talking about that first verse. Flags and signals and beacons are only given to you and I as 
the elect, predestinated family of God. The only people that can... The reason these free will preachers preach revelation, they can't understand it. They don't understand flags and signals and beacons, do they? That's why they can't see. And they're given all these ridiculous... You got scorpions in there, and that's false teachers. That is a parable, isn't it? In, the, in Revelation 9, look at verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded, according as it is written in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And you also find that in Isaiah 29. 29. Isaiah 29. Verse 10, For the Lord hath poured out upon Israel the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered up and it's a mystery to them. And you find this also in Acts 28. Acts 28. And the reason men can't see is they're proud of their doctrine. That's what people do when you give you that. Have you talked to somebody about the truth and they give you that glazed look? Just like, just a dead look like so. That's, that's that dead look of disinterest. They're not even interested in what you're saying. I keep saying this. All they can hear is Charlie Brown's mother while you're talking. Wah, 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 wah. That's all they hear. Wah, 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 wah. They cannot hear death to self, daily cross. They're putting up with you. They built that Bugs Bunny wall, and all they're hearing is Charlie Brown's mother talking, waiting for you, waiting for a break. We as, well, we as Baptists believe, just as soon as you get one break, their pride. God has made them proud, hasn't he? They can't hear and see flags and signals and beacons. Look here in Acts 28, 28, 25. We'll look at 24. Some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive, for the heart of this people are wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing because they can't understand Simeon. Signs, flags, beacons, signals. And their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. I don't want them. Their vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. How me. Let's go back to Revelation 21. See if I can cover something. Revelation 20. All of this is signals and signs. That's what the book of Revelation is. We've talked about Revelation, the 20th chapter, how that it's the thousand years, but it's not a thousand year reign. The word is kilia. It's plural. Plural means 2,000 or more. Or more, it's a 2,000-year period. And the thing about the 2,000-year period, from 96 A.D., John says, things that must shortly come to pass, and we see the events all the way to the end of time. This is the revelation of Christ over the 2,000-year period or over the Kilia. So the Kilia goes with the revelation Kilia, 2000, over this time period, God is going to reveal himself to us with flags and signals out of his word. That's what he's talking about. Then, of course, we see there later in the chapter how that Satan will be bound. 
or earlier in the chapter, how he's bound, and the word is dio, it means to be forbidden from deceiving the nations. The word nation is ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S. That means non-Jews. God's got some non-Jews for the 2,000-year period during the revelation of Christ when he's going to take off the cover. It's not going to be a mystery to us because we understand parables. You know what you have to do to understand any subject that you study? If one of you say, I think I'm going to go up here to uh, Ball State, and Mike's teaching an algebra class up there, a trigonometry class, and you go up there to Ball State and say, I'm going to take a class under Mike. If you go into his class, you're going to have to crucify all of what you have thought, if you've never taken any algebra before, and he's going to give you some college algebra, you're, or give you some calculus, or whatever, you're going to have to crucify all of your opinions about what you think algebra or calculus is about. And you're going to have to go say, I have to dismiss everything that I've ever understood. That's why these people cannot hear the truth. That's why they can't understand flags and signals. I want the truth. I, don't, I will crucify the doctrines of the Baptists that I was raised with. I will nail to the cross that pre-trib rapture and that premillennialism. You have to be willing to make enemies of everybody you know to find the truth. That's what Jesus meant when he said, unless you forsake all that you have, your mother, father, sister, brother, and yourself also, your money, your things, your stuff, your houses, your land, your cars, your jobs. You can't be a learner of the truth. You cannot be a mathetase. Mathetase. That word mathetase is disciple. And then you have the word A-X-I-O-S, axios. We get our word axiom from that. It means something that is equitable or equal. That's what this word axios, it's the word worthy. So worthy and disciple go together. You have to crucify yourself. You go into Mike's math class. He says, look. You say, I am Mike. You know what I think about algebra? He says, I don't care what you think. I'm the teacher. Pay attention. I will tell you when I want one of your answers or thoughts. It'll be on the test at the end of the week. And you better give me the answer I tell you. You crucify any opinions you have. If you don't, you're going to fail. So, when you go into a class, I mean, Anthony, when you went to dentistry school, did you go in there and say, I have an opinion about teeth? <laughs> you can't do that. I mean, when Jerry went to school to learn English, teaching English, he didn't say, wait a minute, I think... I think run is the subject of the sentence. That's my opinion. And I'm going to stick with that. I think throw is the uh, direct object. I'm sorry, but Jerry, you're going to have to crucify that. Aren't you? If you don't go with the definitions... And Mike told one of his professors out at... uh, He was teaching out at Tennessee State... He told one of his professor friends out there, he said, I've learned more about how to teach algebra from my preacher than in all my school life. That's what you said, didn't you, Mike? Where are you? That's what you told him. And, and he said, what was it he said? Well, that was a student. Well, student. Didn't you say he said? They said they never saw it clearer in their life. Well, you said, you said, did he ask you, was he a Baptist or something like that? Oh, that was another professor. He, he asked if you were a Baptist, yeah. Oh, okay. But it's funny because what Mike meant was I define everything I can define. He didn't mean I'm teaching him more algebra. He just meant definition. And Mike said when I really started defining everything in algebra, then I began to learn. 
But you have to be willing to throw out everything in order to learn the Word of God. And when you throw out everything, you're going to throw out your mother, your brother, your sisters, your father. You're going to throw out your grandfather. You're going to throw out their religion. You're going to throw out everything and say, I want the truth. I don't care what it is. I want it. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care who gets mad at me. That's how you learn. You, when I'm looking at a book, I don't say, well, does this go along with Baptist doctrine? Uh, if it don't, that's the way they study. They study, if this gets away from my Baptist doctrine, I'm not going to deal with it. You, to learn anything in any class in the world that you don't know anything about, you have to take a cross into that class and crucify your opinions. That's why the Bible says... You cannot be a mathetes, a disciple, without a daily cross. Unless a man bears his cross and follow me, he can't be my disciple, my learner. It don't matter what class you're taking. That's, that's a standard for taking any course in the world, isn't it? You have to crucify yourself. You can't go in any class with opinions. That's why these people can't see. They've got an opinion that they're proud of. They can't see parables. Where was I? Revelation, 20th chapter. Then, of course, we see Gog and Magog attacking, attacking the beloved city in verse 9. Gog and Magog. And to, you know what Gog and Magog is to most people? Something smoky and hazy. We can't understand Gog and Magog. That's because they have never gone into a set of books like McClinic and Strong and defined Gog and Magog. And it's just as simple as falling off a log. Look up Gog, look up Magog. They'll tell you that Gog comes from Agag, which was a title for the old, a lot of the old ancient pagan kings. You remember Agag, that... Uh, that Saul brought back from Amalek. Agag was a title for ancient pagan kings. And we get the word. Gog is a derivative of that. And the land of Gog was between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. They'll tell you that. And Gog was one. Magog was one of the descendants or sons of Japheth. And nobody ever goes back to look in Genesis to see if. I mean, it doesn't make sense. We name our cities after our heroes. Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Georgia. Columbus this, Columbus that. Washington. These are men. You think they didn't name their lands after men? Yes, they did. Gog and Magog is... There's the Caucasus Mountains right there. Caucasians, that's the Assyrians, that's where we know we come from, us white people. The most pagan people that ever lived, a bunch of Syrians, and, and they're white, and they think they better than everybody else. Caucasians are a bunch of idiots, aren't they? Stupid. I mean, they don't know their background is the most heathen people that's ever existed on the face of the earth. The most barbaric people that's ever lived were Caucasians. Amazing, isn't it? But go down here at some fancy church and say, do you know Caucasians are the most heathen people that's ever been in the world? Why, you're, you're, I, I'm, we, I'm proud, huh? I'm lifted up. And they'll, uh, they'll cough and, and call you a heathen or something. They're stupid. Now, and they're, he's, they're attacking the beloved city. Well, God doesn't call literal Jerusalem beloved in the 11th chapter of Revelation. He calls it Sodom and Egypt. So the beloved city, that is agape. That's, it's agape, O-A-G-A-P-E-O. -E That's the verb form of agape. Agape is walking the commandments of God, for God so loved the world, or in this fashion, he loved the orderly arrangement of mankind, that the all that believe in him. So this is talking about the all of John 3.16. And this is talking about the elect. So wouldn't this be a flag or signal? Beloved city, 
And what is the beloved city? It's heavenly Jerusalem, Hebrews 12, 22. This is a flag. This is a beacon pointing to the church. Isn't it? When you take the word agape and go through the scriptures and define it all, and look at verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Now, the beast is the world ruling system. It's the lion, the bear, and the leopard of Revelation 13. It's the lion, the bear, and the leopard that God said he'll attack Israel with. The lion is Babylon. The bear is Persia, which overthrew Babylon. The leopard is Greece, which overthrew Persia. And Rome overthrew Greece. And it's all the same system. It's one beast. And the false prophet. What's the false prophet? It's not one man. What represents the world beast system is false teachings. It's every man who preaches a lie. Where the beast and the false prophet are, and what amazes me, people try, hold on a second here, I'm looking for something. Yeah, here it is. People try to say, hell is not forever and ever. Uh, what in the world is it when it says here, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. What is that? Forever and ever. Huh? Part of the ever. Part of the ever. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> yeah. Part of forever. Yeah. Let me see here. I got something I was going to read to you. Well, I thought I had something I was going to read to you. Yeah. I think I got it here. Well. No, I didn't have it. I'll read it to you later. Now. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now. The great white throne, you find that in 1 Kings 10. Go to 1 Kings 10. 1 Kings 10. I'll get it in a minute. I'm turning here and I've got papers falling all over me. 1 Kings 10, verse 18. This is Solomon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory. This, this was called the great white throne in the Old Testament. And overlaid it with the best gold. The throne had six steps. And the top of the throne was round behind. And there were stays on either side on the place of the seat. And two lines stood beside the stays. And twelve lines stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. And there was not, like, not the like made in any kingdom. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels, and it goes on here, this was King Solomon's throne. It was a great white throne. This is a picture of the throne of Solomon is what it's talking about. And, of course, a throne was a stationary place where the king ruled from. A judgment seat was a mobile throne, and that's what the, that's what the, the mercy seat was on the Ark of the Covenant. When the fire would start moving, they would start packing up. The Kohathites would pack up all the vessels of the temple and start moving and following the cloud or the fire whether it was by day or night. When the cloud moved or the fire moved, that means get pack things up quick. God's moving. And that's how they knew to go where they went. They followed the cloud. They followed the fire. 
And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it. This is speaking, of course, of Christ sitting upon the throne. And he is of the seed of David. And the throne was established by Solomon, the son of David. Of course, David was a man of war. And the scripture says that David could not build the temple because he was a man of war. He had his son. Solomon had to build it because he was a man of peace. And I saw the dead small. Well, I ought to give you one other verse there. Second Chronicles. Look at Second Chronicles. Go further. Second Chronicles 9. Second Chronicles 9. Second Chronicles 9 and verse 17. 917. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with gold. I thought I'd just go ahead and give you that. That's that is Chronicles, that second Chronicles account of First Kings, the tenth chapter, the eighteenth verse. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now, there is the Lamb's book of life. There's two books. The Lamb's book of life and the book of life. This is a reference to the Lamb's book of life. The book of life, in the Old Testament... That is where they kept their chronological records of whose son was who. That's where the Pharisees would go and look at their ancestry. And that's what Paul would call uh, uh, endless genealogies. Genealogies are good to study. But just to study and say, my grandfather was uh, a preacher and, and, and my father was a Pharisee and my grandfather was a Pharisee. And they went around bragging on who their family was. This is a reference to the book of life in heaven or the Lamb's book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Remember, 2 Corinthians 5. Look at it one more time. I read it the other night. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat is the... The judgment seat was a mobile throne. It was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top of it. Where is the throne of God now? In our hearts. And we are mobile. We are a mobile throne, aren't we? We are mobile... The Bible speaks of us as being tabernacles. In fact, there in Revelation 21 and 3, I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The word tabernacle there is the word S-K-E-N-E. And that word has the idea of a wife that is useful to the husband. We are the wife, the bride of Christ, and we are the tabernacle of God. And he says here that every man shall be stand before the judgment seat. We are being judged right now. I went through that the other night. The word judge, the word judge is the word crino, and it means to decide Guilt or innocence. Well, we have been declared innocent. We have been justified. Or the word is dikaiao, D-I-K-A-I-O-O. That word means to render innocent. We have been judged innocent by our works. And it is what it is. That is the word ergon. We went through that last Wednesday night. Ergon means to toil. And the works that are in us, uh, Philippians 2.13, it's God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
That's, we're being judged before the judgment seat of Christ right now, and His judgment seat is in our hearts, isn't it? Huh? It's in our hearts. The word judgment seat is the word bema. B-E-M-A. And it means presence. We are in God's presence daily, aren't we? The, the seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord. When the priest went inside the holy place, they had to eat the bread from the table of showbread. This was their, sub, their sustenance. When they were in their course on duty, they ate bread from the table of showbread. They dipped a flesh hook down here into this, uh, into this altar, and with the flesh hook, whatever they pulled up, that's what they got to eat that day. They ate from the altar. This was called, the altar was called the table of the Lord. Table of the Lord. Well, that is a parable and a picture of the cross. We eat of the cross, don't we? This right here was the table of the Lord where they offered the sacrifices. And the altar now is the daily cross. So when they ate of this altar, we eat of the daily cross, don't we? Or we partake of the daily cross. To eat didn't mean to put something in your mouth and chew. We partake of the cross. And when they came into the holy place, the outer part of the tabernacle, they had to eat this showbread facing the candlesticks. And the Jews said, to be in a man's presence, one of the titles for the table of the showbread was the bread of his presence. Of his presence. They said, that it, they said that if you, if you were standing in front of a man, and he was facing you, and you turned around, you were no longer in his presence. And they had to eat the bread facing the candlesticks, and that was in the presence of God. What, what are the seven candlesticks? The eyes of the Lord. To be in a man's presence, you had to be facing his eyes, his face. Oh, by the way, there's four titles to this bread. One of the titles was the daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. That's the shadow in the Old Testament. The New Testament, the bread is the word of God. It's Christ, isn't it? When he said, give us this day our daily bread, you don't have to pray for food. That doesn't mean to pray for your food. The Bible says, take no thought for your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. You don't pray for food. Then he says later on, Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and food and clothing will be added unto you. You don't pray for food. You seek the kingdom of God and your sustenance will be given. The daily bread is a picture of Christ in us. Yeah, that was the same thing. And, of course, another title for this, another title for this was the pierced bread. Why does a woman pierce bread why she punch holes in it when she huh so it'll cook through and through yeah and she and she'll punch holes in the top of a pie this was the pierced bread the bread is the body of the church and there's a new testament word try Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That is the word P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. 
parasmos, that's a common word for the trials of life. And from parasmos, we get P-E-I-R-A. That word means to pierce. In scorpion, means to pierce. And scorpions were false teachers, and these are evil men that are piercing us and putting us through the trials. And that's one of the titles for the bread, and we being men are one bread and one body, and we're the bread, and we're being pierced. That's the word kalal, pierced. You can go out here to Bread and Company out in Green Hills, and you can buy some kalal bread. And it's good, yeah. Challah. It's the pierced bread. It's amazing, isn't it? In fact, I think that's in, uh, let me see, Leviticus. You find the four titles in Leviticus. I, I hadn't taught on this in years. And sometimes I forget. Hold on, let me see here. Here it is. Leviticus 24. I thought that was it. 24. Verse 5, how did I get here? Huh? And thou shalt take fine flour and bake 12 cakes. The word cake is the word kala, C-H-A-L-L-A-H. C-H. We were talking about eating the bread in the presence of the face of God, weren't we? And thou shalt take fine flour, bake 12 cakes. The word cake is the word kala, C-H-A-L-L-A-H. C-H-A-L-L-A-H, kala. Uh, and it's got several, delivery, uh, several derivatives. It comes from C-H-A-L-A-H, which means sick, afflicted, or to grieve. Isn't that amazing? C-H-A-L-A-H. It's a derivative of this word, kala, which means sick, afflicted, or to grieve. Isn't that what we go through? Whew. I got an old series on the bread. I got a series called the Bread Series. It's a very interesting series. <laughs> Another series. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it something... And uh, uh, I'll come back. I'll come back. I'm out of time, ain't I? I didn't get to finish what I was talking about. Well, I will come back. Boy, we covered some territory, didn't we? Hmm. What was I going to give you? I got so much more. I get carried away sometimes. Uh, the Bread series about 10 years ago was one of my most requested series. In fact, I had everybody request the Bread series. I got a hair series too. Hair. It's called Hair Series. And the first tape I did was the title of it was Hair. Yeah. I like the hair series, and the bread series is good, too. I'm sorry I didn't get any further than I did. Um, we're, the works we're going to be judged for is Christ working in us. I may just bring out the different bread titles for the show bread next week. Go back to this and bring it out. It's, it's amazing where you can go to Revelation where it takes you. It takes you all through the Scriptures, doesn't it? Huh? What? Yeah. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. Lord, keep opening this scripture to us. Keep opening up the book. May we see these truths, Father. Help us to see the flags and the beacons and the signals and the signs. We know we have to dismiss everything that we've ever thought and go to these scholarly men and define these words in the culture to find the truth. 
Lord, we are willing to hate our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and ourselves. We have to hate our opinions to understand this book. We've got to believe no one but you. Teach us that more every day. Lord, we pray for Danny. Give him strength to let go of the things that hold him down. Maybe his family, his church, his salary, his income. Lord, help him. He's in a struggle. Help us all, Lord. Give us strength and courage to continue. And we'll give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen.